Welcome, everyone, to the 66th episode of the New Gen Mindset Podcast. I'm Dan Kozella here with Nick Tartaglia. Um, I apologize about the sunlight in the background. Um, it's a beautiful day today, finally. It is. Um, I, I hope it's not as cold as it looks. You know, but... Well, it um, feels, I should say. I, I, would, I would like there to be palm trees in the back. That would be nice. But um, listen... We would like a lot of things to be here in Quebec. Yeah, exactly. Um, how are you, man? I'm good. I've been going back to the gym now, so I feel way better than I used to. It's almost two years of barely working out, so now it's good. two weeks of consistency. Good, good thing we're not a fitness podcast because yeah, we would be we would get an F minus for that stuff. <laughs> I think we've been doing an okay job. With I missed it honestly about. with the lockdowns and the shutdowns and the it's it just so it just been out of for so long and I'm finally back and it feels good. I feel fresh. I feel more energized. So. I'm happy, you know, I'm like, it's depressing to feel like, you know, you haven't moved. Yeah. Cause you were like in total isolation. Um, and I find that everybody's slowly getting back into the rhythm of things. Spring, spring fever is kind of like that thing, the cliche that everyone's talking about. Um, Q1 just ended uh, crazy enough. I mean, feels like it didn't even happen, but a lot of things did happen. I think this was yeah. the worst quarter in the stock market for, uh, quite some time, probably in the last two years, going back to when we had the COVID, you know, lockdowns of 2020. So um, a lot has kind of happened. Um, but another thing is kind of also happened in the last two to three weeks that is catching everyone's attention. Um, and this is going to be the narrative that is going to dominate, I think, the headlines for the next uh, 12 to 18 months, at least in this market right now. And that's that silly little yield curve that everyone's mm -hmm. talking about, right? So. Um, what we're going to do today, Nick, uh, just briefly explain what that is to our audience, because most people are trying to understand what it ultimately means. Uh, and then the other thing, too, is, you know, people are like, OK, there's no actual war going on. Like violence seems like it's kind of slowed down. There is a financial war going on, though, and it's a really bad one that um, unfortunately is going to hit the shelves of your local grocery store, probably within the next two to three months. There's no question about that. The longer it prolongs, the more likely the, the, the expectation of that outcome is. Exactly. So people are like, hey, the war is over. But wait a minute. We just sanctioned an entire country responsible for what seems to be about 25 to 30 percent of very important resources globally. Yeah. Right. So uh, mm -hmm. something, something to pay attention to. But the, again, the first thing I think we should talk about is this yield curve. Mm -hmm. Right. What is it? What does it actually mean? Um, where are we heading? And usually when the yield curve uh, gets spoken about in, in the media, um, or at least in, everywhere, it's going to be talked about, I think, for the next 12 to 18 months. Um, it basically talks about the relationship of interest rates on fixed income assets, particularly bonds, uh, over different time horizons, or as they call it in finance, different maturities, right? So the best way to gauge it is through the two year, the five year, the 10 year and the 30 year. This is important because this actually contributes to mortgage payments, any debt financing, any business that is taken out a loan. This is going to affect them tremendously because there's something that's been lurking in the background, uh, higher inflation. Yeah. How do we control higher inflation? Well, the Fed clearly, and this is a very simple explanation, it's much more complicated than, than what I'm about to say, but the Fed has to, or the Bank of Canada too, they, they got to continue to increase interest rates because this is, and it's a very delicate situation now because if they do it too quickly, no. you're going to have a stock market crash. But and, if you do it too slow. But if you do it too slow, people are going to look back at you and say, hey, you guys are doing it too slow. So it's like, oh my goodness. But yeah. this whole- but they put themselves, they put themselves in this position. Yeah, and I think you just have to look at it historically too. Like go back to 06, 07, about right before 08 happened. Um, I think interest rates were at the highest um, in, in, in the last two decades. Interest yeah. rates were probably around 5%. Um, and Alan Greenspan, who was the former uh, Fed chair- uh, comes out and basically says, hey, uh, the economy is stronger than ever. Everyone believes him because he's a so-called expert, right? The same thing they're, they're claiming right now. <laughs> you know, <laughs> like everything economy, strong economy. It, it, you know, so I kind of just laugh at that. And I'm just like, well, wait a minute. Like everybody always says the same thing. It's like, oh, well, this time it's different. Yeah. Is it though? Anytime I hear that, I have alarm bells that go off. But the point is the yield curve inverting means that the shorter rate interest or the shorter time frame, I should say, 
the shorter time frame is higher than the longer time frame. That means borrowing now is becoming more expensive. So think about it. All those people who bought houses, that sugar rush where people are like, yo, rates are you know, at 0%, I should go buy a house. Well, if you don't budget properly, that asset that you bought is going to become an asset to the bank potentially or and a liability to your flow of income. So um, yeah. there's a lot of stuff that's going to transpire. And usually the last thing that I would say uh, is that when the yield curve really inverts, that usually is an early sign of a potential recession. Mm -hmm. I don't know about that yet. You got to see the economic data come in, right? And that's going to come down to consumer data as well as housing starts. It seems like the housing market has kind of slowed down on the, in yeah. the last Well, look at the, months. if you look at the 30 year mortgage rates on housing, I think it went from like two point mid to relatively high 2% range all the way up to the mid four, uh, four point something range. Uh, in a couple months, that's a drastic increase in a really fast amount of time. And that trend continues with remortgages and refinancing and all those things. You know, that the, the housing market is an indicator of if that goes down, well, that can bring the stock market down with it because that's a strong indication of overall wealth. And if people feel less wealthy, well, they're going to spend less. And if they spend less, then you'd put yourself in a recession because people are not going to spend. Yeah. And I think that goes back to like, like you said, consumer spending. That's probably the most important indicator that I'm looking at right now in terms of the strength or the so-called strength of this economy, um, which unfortunately, talking to a lot of people, they believe that we're probably 12 to 18 months from a recession. Can't confirm that yet, but charts are pretty much sounding the alarm as we speak. And usually when commodity prices go through the roof, as, the, as they've been going right now, that's also another indicator uh, that a recession is looming historically, right? And the last time oil reached about 120 bucks, you know, 08 happened and that was pretty much it. So there's a lot of pieces coming together right now that are signaling, hey, this 10 year, this multi-decade bull rally that we had where people were just leveraging themselves and just buying things that, you know, they couldn't necessarily afford, like that might come to an end very yeah. quickly. But it also essential, signals non essential spending is going to become a very, uh, people are going to start contemplating decisions more and more than they used to, especially the younger generations. Absolutely. So um, that's something that I'm just paying attention to right now. And I think most people, most proactive investors in this market need to start paying attention to. If you guys, um, if you want to say, if, especially when it comes to this type of data, if you guys want, I know we've had, uh, we've had Tavi Costa on two times. I would definitely go recommend go see some of his graphs. He talks a lot about these um, reverse, uh, the treasury yields and the inversion occurring. And he puts beautiful graphs that really highlight all the situations. So if you want to see some graphs that really help you kind of give you a general idea of what's going on from a macro perspective, I definitely go to his uh, Instagram at Tavi, uh, Tavi Costa Macro. You'll get some nice graphs. I'll we'll talk about this and I'll make you understand a little easier too. Yeah. First of all, I love those graphs and I repost them because yeah. like he's been on the ball, I think for the last, you know, two years with a lot yeah, of the yeah. stuff that's been going on. So I, I, I owe it to him because I, my portfolio is up on certain commodity plays, which is great. <laughs> um, but yeah, like Nick, from a consumer spending perspective, um, I don't think people realize that, you know, buying a house ultimately with a mortgage and not having the right you know, significant income come in is, is going to harm a lot of people. They're not even, they're not even realizing it yet because it's this little lifestyle thing that we're trying to maintain. This is a millennial and Gen Z thing as well. And look, there's nothing wrong with that. Like you want to live a certain way, go ahead, you know, but understand that there, are, we live on an economic planet. There's going to be yeah. financial consequences, unfortunately, if you don't prepare for this. Right. It so, scares me because in most the last two years, most people's kind of budgeting thesis when they purchased these houses was one on a much lower rate. Even if you did some sort of adjustment, you said, okay, I can afford a higher rate, even if rates do go up. Okay, cool. But I think a lot of people ignored as a variable is this inflationary pressure, which is driving up nearly every single input cost. So even if I have a house now, my cost to maintaining my house is gone way up. My energy cost, uh, if I want to do any labor work or kind of like a general contracting work, all those things have gone way up in price. So not just my rate going up, it's all my input cost to maintaining my house also that have gone up. And that's just going to put a lot of pressure on people's liquidity and, and ability to actually do other things with their capital. So will it, one, drive up more debt and we'll have an environment where people are going to keep just increasing their debt? Or will it create an environment where people are going to be like, okay, now we're screwed. 
we have to start shifting our consumption behavior and start saving or start actually buying more of essential goods, which then would drive up more of a demand on essential goods relative to the supply, causing more inflation on certain goods because people want to stockpile in this environment with all the geopolitical tension. So it's like a lot of home buyers already were on thin ice. And this is just adding fire to the fuel right now. I, I would also say like in Canada, I, I mean, I'll speak on behalf of Canadians or people that live in this province. I mean, you know, let's say you're making $120,000 a year. Uh, 50% of that's going to go to the government. Mm -hmm. So you're, you're left with $60,000. If you're a family, you probably have two kids, maybe a kid or whatever. The kid's going to cost you 10 grand each. And I'm being modest here. I've no, I'm, I'm just sharing this because I had this conversation with a few people who are just like, it's actually impossible to live if you have a fixed asset right now that's a home and there's all these like expenses that come out. You're literally probably going to be left with less than like $10,000 for the year. So do the math like per month. It's like ridiculous. It's like if we had a business, because typically in this environment, we, we're expecting of businesses to increase their profit margins, decreasing their costs or increasing the revenues in order to offset the inflationary impact. That's what we have an expectation there. But when it comes to individuals, we have wages that are not growing. We have inflationary pressures going up, which is incre uh, increasing their costs. So their margins from a profit standpoint are getting destroyed on every single angle. So it's like you're, ex you're, you're kind of forward multiple expectation of, of like investment activity and from individual standpoint is going, especially for the middle class is, is getting destroyed. Yeah. And I would also say, like, I always get a question. It's like, well, how do you anticipate or at least how do you prepare for this? And my my response always surprises people because they're just like, what do you mean? Like, you're you're young, like live a little bit. And I'm just like, I just I'm being honest. I just live below my means. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? I don't I don't need to go. And I'm not trying to bash people here. If you can go do this, go ahead. But it's just like you want to go spend twenty five hundred bucks on bottles every Saturday. Go ahead. But there, that is a thing. Like people will literally wait till the weekend, spend their paycheck and then realize why am I so, <laughs> why do I not have any money left over? And it's this long-term game that's being sacrificed over instant gratification, yeah, I find. Exactly. So the, a short-term so, thinker versus the long-term thinker. Yeah. So back to sort of the, you know, the finance aspect of this, um, you know, when, when you make, you know, if you're making 120,000, and you have a mortgage payment and you got to pay about, I don't know, $400, $500 a month, not including any additional expenses. And you have a car. I mean, your living expenses are going anywhere between $25 to $3,000 $3, a month. That's, the that's the situation. Food. That's the situation, right? And most of the, most of the mortgages, about, I think in Canada especially, there's like 52% of them are variable mortgages. I mean, when I read that stat, I was just like, oh my God, if you study what happened in 08, every single mortgage that was financed and then repurposed, which investment banks sold as derivatives to make a shitload of money, <laughs> as soon as those rates hit a certain level, the entire system just collapses. Now, I don't think we're going to have like another 08. I'd be shocked if we did, but it, it would just pretty much prove that in the last 15 years, you know, we as humans have not learned a single thing and greed just continues to dominate, right? So far, it doesn't look like we have learned anything, honestly. I mean, you're you're As like the, you're like point. you're like the philosoph philosophical economist with the psychology. <laughs> so, like, you understand. You're like, yeah, like people just get caught up in this whole greed cycle, and it just repeats, right? Especially, so I, look, think of it this way. Okay, here's another scenario that I look at is. So boomers had the experience of the, of the 2000 kind of like fear of the market collapsing and the 2008, okay? So that fear has allowed them to understand to an extent, although they, some of them have kind of like forgotten that fear, that you have to be careful when it comes to markets and, fine, and investing and all that stuff. So they've had that pressure. So they were a little more hesitant and it kind of drove them out of the markets to not be directly their own investor. Millennials have never really experienced this environment. Millennials. What about what about the Gen Zs? Exactly. They just, so think, the, they just think a JPEG is going to generate alpha returns, and that's how they're going to make wealth. <laughs> so the younger guys, we've never experienced this environment. So now we have this environment where people are seeing inflation. What if people always said, "Oh, when we had like two, three percent inflation, was always okay." So we have inflation. You need to invest. Investing will help you hedge against inflation because it'll make it'll prevent you from losing actual you know percent value of your overall capital. Sure. That's in a low inflationary environment, but in a high inflationary environment, it seems to be driving a lot of people to want to take a lot more risk to 
kind of try to make as much money as possible as quickly to as offset possible. that fear of inflation going crazy right now. So it, it, it sees it because now we have this risk on behavior back in the market again, because people are just feeding or just like obsessed with the potential of trying to make as much money as possible. But the thing is, if you're thinking and behaving in this moment right now, whatever wave is coming at us in 12, 6, 12 or 16 months, you're not paying attention to it. You need to be hedging yourself now for that future wave. Yeah, and that's, so that, that's, that's what scares me because this could be an environment where they finally realize that you you can't you can't be well. I mean, people will always be greedy, and people will never truly learn from the mistakes. But we gotta we gotta tone down the greed and the obsession. We're just trying to make as much money as possible fast because we need to play the long game here, not the short game. Yeah, and I would also say like not trying to discourage anybody wanting to go you know, go out there and make more money. That's not what we're saying. Mm. But when there's, there's, there's a saying, it's like making money is actually very easy. You just have to focus on one thing, do a lot of that consistently, and then get that. The hard part is maintaining, keeping that money and then growing it yeah. for further wealth. That's what I would say a good portion of the population have a very hard time doing because they're always about, I need to do this now. I need to do this now. Right. So yeah. I want to just, you, you touched on something that was interesting. It was just like, Hey, you know, everyone's so fixated on this like idea of making as much money as quickly as possible. Right. You're not saying get into the market and then stay out of the market. Right. When shit hits the fan. Right. The key is to stay invested. Right. Depends but on what too. That's yeah, that, that, that is true. But you know, the other thing that I've realized too, is I get messages all the time. People saying, Hey, I'm going to liquidate my entire portfolio. I'm like, why are you doing that? What the hell's wrong with you? Like you're going to go zero cat. You're going to go hundred percent cash and just time this thing. Like stop doing that. Mm -hmm. What you should do is what I started doing recently is I rebalanced my portfolio. I started cutting my losers and then adding to some of the winners that I think are going to continue just based on this macro environment. You should never liquidate your entire portfolio. The moment you have that in your mind, that right there is actually a key that you're trying to make money as quickly as possible. Wouldn't you agree? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. See, the thing is, what, the way I see things right now is if I'm going to take money out, I'm taking money out more from a uh, aggressive growth standpoint. I'm, I'm, I'm fully invested in terms of a defensive and hedge angle. I want cash flow. I want dividends. I want strong energy. I want commodities. <clears throat> so the way I'm allocated is that even if the market comes down and I have this nice dividend like generating going on as the, as the actual value of the stock goes down, my dividend is just going to buy more equity. So it doesn't really matter if the market goes down relative from my defensive standpoint, but from regressive standpoint, I don't want to be aggressive when the market is this insane at this level, at this volatility with this much geopolitical tension and this economic chaos. I'd rather be chaotic, uh, sorry, aggressive and more greedy when the market is down at a bottom than at a peak. Doesn't make sense. At this level, I want to get a little more defensive and get ready for one to get back aggressive. Because I don't want to attack in this environment. I want to be defensive and hedged in this environment. And then I want to attack when the market takes a tank. Because I'm more hedged with liquidity, cash flow, and stuff like that. Because if you have a strong yeah. dividend portfolio, right, and the market goes down, let's say, hypothetically speaking, well, let's say Rio Tinto right now. Rio Tinto is generating a 10% yield. So the market goes down, Rio Tinto loses 40% of, uh, of its value. No worries. The yield will probably double in that environment to 20%, but it won't stay there very long. And at that point, my dividends are just buying more stock at a much cheaper price. So I'm buying more equity as the price goes down. So for me, that's why it's like, that's how I'm hedged right now in this environment. That type Parti of- uh, Yeah, particularly with commodities. It's, yeah, exactly. Energy, not, not commodities, time. and stuff like that. I, I, I'm staying away from retail, like- uh, non-essential retail things i'm nowhere near that i don't because with inflation possible recession uh and all that stuff that that's people are not going to spend money on things that they don't need anymore it's going to be about things they need well that's where consumer staples become very attractive <laughs> ironically I'll, I'll use an example and we'll get back to fixed income and yield curve in a second but um you know dollarama there was a headline this week <laughs> where they were just like, yeah, the minimum prices of our, of our stuff are going to be $5. And like yeah. the, me the meme now is, why don't we just rebrand it to five -orama? 
I have a rough. No, a dollar store is now no longer a dollar store. I mean, talk about inflation hitting everything. Exactly. You know, it's so, <laughs> so, so, you know, I don't know. I, 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 I just, it's, 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 we're reaching a point now where our generation and I think the younger generation is actually going to start realizing, hey, like we need a, we need a smack in the face financially to really understand how these cycles work because mm-hmm. it's ultimately what it comes down and to. And that's the thing at the end of the day is once you start observing these cycles and you start familiar, familiarating yourself with it and understanding it to the extent that you can, you have to, as an investor, you can't be the same type of investor to any market in any cycle. You can't, it doesn't make sense. You have to cycle. It's just like anything else. You need to adapt your investment behavior in accordance to the market cycle, the market and the cycle it's at. Because if you don't, you're going to be either destroyed on the downside or you're going to miss out on the upside. You have to adjust on the ups and the downsides. I, I think that's more of a uh, swing trader mentality too, which is there's nothing wrong with it too. I, I you know, there's different types of swing. But, it's, but if, when you're building your portfolio, you know, it's like, I don't want it like, say, for example, right now, I'm not going to go, you don't want to be a hundred percent in uh, tech, tech right now. Yeah, of course. You know what I'm saying? But you could be a hundred percent in dividends and energy and stuff. Not necessarily that you're going to get much upside to that, but at least you'll generate a nice downside protection and some cash flow. But the point is you, you, you have to accommodate yourself based on the market. You need to pull out a bit when markets are a little chaotic or you, you have to adapt a bit. If there's no adaptation, your portfolio just, I think, just, I think what you're saying is adaptation is always have enough cash in the portfolio. And, like acor- and adjust according to whatever the market yeah, looks like. And then re- rebalance accordingly. Which, yeah, exactly. Yeah, I, I mean, I do that. I did that last week, you know, and like, you know, um, so anyway, back to uh, fixed income. Uh, it, again, this doesn't get talked about enough just because everyone's so fixated on stocks. Yeah. Uh, crypto is flying right now. There was an April Fool's thing that sent crypto. They're like, yeah, crypto crashes to 22K. That actually sent crypto down lower. If that happened to a stock with a press release that they would be a full on investigation, but it just shows you how crazy that market is. And I'm not trying to bash it. I mean, again, I have crypto. I, I don't mm-hmm. trade it. I just buy and hold. And I think, yeah, yeah, yeah. again, not investment advice. That's just my opinion. <laughs> um, but yeah, like, you know, <laughs> fix, fixed income is going to make a comeback, I think in the next three years uh, as an investment because of where yields are going. And I'll explain why when yields go up, yields also refer to as rates. Rates are going to have to go up to control this environment. But traditionally, what happens is when yields rise, the price of the bonds or the fixed income actually goes down. That's a good thing. It's an inverse relationship with bonds. It's not like stocks or interest rates and stuff like that. But you know, when, when yields go up, bond prices go down. When yields go down, bond prices go up. So what I'm going to anticipate is that for downside protection, Nick, for what you're talking about, um, I think bonds are slowly going to make a comeback here. Um, especially for the more conservative investor. Now, everyone who's listening is going to be like, well, why would you say that? You sound like a boomer. Well, this goes back to Nick's point. You got to adjust your mentality. You got to adjust your investment thesis for these market cycles. Um, And we are going to reach a point where I think interest rates will eventually hit 1%. And when they do hit that, you know, bonds might actually be more attractive to buy in this environment. Um, So something to keep an eye out for. That that's where that's where this environment, when that shift really occurs, you're gonna get a rush out of growth and pure into value equity, really relatively to strong balance sheets, cash flow, dividends, things that people know they can generate some sort of hedge against the inflation. If I know I'm generating 3% bonds or I'm generating 4% dividend here, fuck it. At this point, if I'm losing, because it's really hard to say I'm going to beat 7% inflation, 8% inflation, especially with the potential stagnation of the economy. So let's say things stagnate. It's really, really hard to say I'm going to beat the market. I'm going to beat inflation, whatever the case may be. So you'll accept a 1% loss, real uh, loss return. You'll accept a 2 3% return, but you got to be generating something. And yeah. And you're afraid of, and if you're worried that there's not that much growth left on the upside, well, at least dividends and bonds will give you that secure type of like fixed return that you can expect for something from. Again, there's also something called treasury inflation protected insurance or securities as they're called. They're called tips mm. uh, and tips are type of bonds that you can buy that guarantee. Uh, I don't want to say guarantee. I got to be careful what I say here, but they actually uh, in a very simplistic way, they protect you against inflation. 
Uh, and those are good to have. I mean, like people are like, well, why is that not generating a return? It's like, I do not want a specific, I don't want my entire portfolio to be risk on, mm -hmm. you know, I already it's like have a team. that. It's like a team. You have exactly. to, your forward, your defense, your goalie, you know, you got to spread things out a bit a little. Yeah. And I think bonds honestly are going to be a very attractive investment uh, going into the next couple of years here, just because of this environment. Um, you know, you're going to see, you're going to see tremendous inflow into that. Now, how does that affect the interest rate market? We'll, we'll have to see. But I, I, at the end of the day, if by the end of this year, the Fed interest rate is not at least 75 or 50 basis points, we have a problem because that means that, you know, they believe that the job market, right? Because this is always their decision rides on the job market. Yeah, that spending basically are two favorite it, metrics. How much it, do I spend? Are you spending money? Sure. That generates the, 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 the movement of the capital and that makes the money and then the, the labor market because people will spend. But, but the conundrum now, Nick, is that they've printed so much money. So I'm going to get in trouble for saying this. I think most of the economic indicators that they published are total BS. Of course. I think they're significantly overstating what is actually happening. So we're, we're, we're in this environment now where it's like, Hey, we're sitting on our hands, you know, I'm adding to oil and gas because I just think this is like ridiculous. It's a supply demand issue now. It's not even like speculation. It's like, like in Canada, fun, fun we money. just, they just went ahead and increased the carbon tax. You know, it's like, oh, prices are not already high enough. We're just going to make it more expensive. And ironically, a carbon tax is just a raise for most of these politicians who don't know anything about economics, unfortunately. <laughs> but you're, yeah, we're running into this very, uncertainty of an environment. Now the market is going to market seems to have priced in a lot of the stuff that we're seeing right now that could change. And I think we talked about this before we got on the show. That one thing that can make it more uncertain is if China invades Taiwan, right? Uh, that is a very sensitive topic, but it, it will, it will affect the market. Of course. Um, it will send, it will send a bit of more uncertainty and, and the market hates that. And usually when that happens, you might actually see rates spike even more, right? Now, the question is, in this environment, would they want to increase rates if they want to spend more money in order to be able to handle whatever military cause they have to go after? Because if they raise rates, can they afford to not only pay all the debt with the higher interest rates, plus maintain liquidity to fund their operations overseas? Because they're going to need more money. So well, I, I feel like there's also another roadblock with that when, type of like the dilemma. When the treasury market is pricing in 2.5 or 2.4% interest rate and the Fed's fund rate is at 50 basis points or 0.5%, look at that gap. That's the first thing. The second thing that I would say, and I'm glad I'm not, I'm glad I'm not the Fed. I don't have that job because he's probably going through his mind and saying, okay, this is, there's a lot of factors here that are in play. You know, what are we, what are we basing this off of? Right. Again, Nick, I think we're speculating here in terms mm -hmm. of a potential risk that is on the horizon. I don't want to make a prediction because that's not but what the narrative doing. is there. You, you were the, the talk of Taiwan and the U S Chinese tension in relation to Taiwan is growing. I am seeing it being mentioned more than usual, which means I'm expecting something. And it might never happen. Yeah, 100%. Which is great, but you got to prepare for that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the, the thing that's going to prepare you for that right now is just, again, owning commodities, owning owning those things right now that are in total shortage, I think, right now are, 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 are beneficial to be in, in your portfolio. Again, tech, 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 names, tech names will do well over the next decade, but they have the risk of potentially getting much lower and you could be paying a lot lower when that time actually comes, you know? Yeah. I'll use Shopify as an example. By the way, great business. I mean, that thing was trading at 2200 bucks. I don't know, six months ago, three I months ago, multiple, whatever it was. The P multiple is like 800. Which was insane. And then, and then two, two or three weeks ago, it was down to like 600 bucks. Yeah. So it just shows you like tech is a very risky investment when you're buying at these insane valuations. And I found it so funny when people were like messaging me, they're like, why aren't you buying this? Why aren't you buying that? I'm like, guys, look at the multiple, look at the PE on this. You're buying this at this price. Are you nuts? Are you prepared to lose 50%? They're like, what do you mean? I'm like, you do realize that if shit hits the fan, 
possibly. And I wasn't making a forecast. It was more of like a risk. Uh, it, it was more like a risk analysis. Yeah. Do you realize that if shit hits the fan with tech and rates go up, like these stocks will drop almost like 50%. The stocks dropped almost 80% from their highs. So it just goes to show you, this is a very, th this entire game, Nick, goes back to what we talked about at the beginning. It's all about risk management. You know, people putting in like 100% of their equity into one stock for them to hit a home run is just, yeah. it's stupid. Especially it doesn't matter how much, it doesn't matter how much the dollar value is, by the way. Mm. Right. It goes back to the percentage allocation that you're going to do. Right. So I, it's just that, that's, that's the thing that just surprises me is like, you know, the, this environment right now is not designed for, to own tech stocks yet. Yet, no. I believe so. See, the thing is, in this environment, I don't think like typically if you have overall relatively like, you know, balanced economy, things are doing well, people are, people are moving, economic activity is going, there's global trade, you know, things are developing, there's innovation, there's movement, <clears throat> not so much government intervention. <clears throat> you can afford to be a micro thinker in, the, in, the, in terms of your investment style. Because the, 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 the macro game is not so relevant, but we're in an inverse reality right now where the macro realm is far more critical to making your micro decisions because it's so heavily impacted. So you can't just narrow in and just, oh, I'm going to invest in this sector and like I'm only invest in tech or I'm going to just go small cap and I'm just going to try to pick because anybody, as long as they have a good business, they're going to do well. No, 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 no. The, the global the development and mechanics can impede any, even if it's a good potential business, the global environment can completely impede that development. You have to balance yourself with that reality now. I want to build on that. Just simplify it. Why stocks actually dropped, especially tech stocks. It goes back to uh, profitability. And when you run a DCF, which is known as a discounted free cash flow model, um, the way to get to the share value of the stock is dividing it by the interest rate. And that's what a lot of people don't understand when they're buying tech stocks. They're like, what do you mean high interest rates are going to affect tech? Well, think <clears> about it. It's, it's a simple division calculation. If rates go up, tech stocks get crushed because their value just decreases based on a very... Listen, DCF is just, just the cash discounted flow. cash flow <clears throat> divided by the interest rate gets you the share price. It's a very simplistic... I mean, you guys could Google it, do your own research, but I'm just explaining it very simply. So... When the interest rate goes up, which is the denominator, it cuts the price of the shares in half yeah. almost. It makes a huge difference over a 10 year, 20 year, 30 year period of time. That makes a huge difference. Yeah. The guys that actually are the, the guys, the, the, the sectors that do well in higher interest rate environments are financials. No kidding, because banks are tightening, insurance companies are getting more for their premium. So you want to also potentially look at those sectors. I, I have very little financial exposure, ironically. Yeah, me too. I just don't, I just not comfortable for some reason. I it's, it's too hard to value. And if you're just chasing the dividend, okay, yeah. great. Like that's fine. You know, own a bank stock for the dividend. There's nothing wrong with that. It's just, I would rather own something that is going to pay me a dividend based on higher commodity prices because mm -hmm. of a higher inflationary environment. I don't know. It's just me. And I can, I can better build out the thesis on sectors like that over a longer period of time than I can really to, relatively to financials right now because of all the craziness and the, 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 the interest rates and the mortgages and, and all the debt and the government. So it's like, eh, I'd rather not. It's like, I, I, it's a hot potato for me playing with the financials. Like I'm not, so I'm not comfortable. So I'm a little, uh, I'm, not, I'm staying away from that right now. I, I would also say that the important thing too, to watch with like the banks is like, when does lending actually start tightening even more? And that usually signals uh, a slowdown in consumer spending, right? Or that household debt has potentially gone through the roof. So that's another thing. But um, another sector that kind of gets hit by interest rate increases as well is real estate. Um, same thing, DCF, usually with REITs though. Um, it's all about a, you know, I, I forget what it's called, but it's a different valuation metric. It's based on net asset value usually. But, you know, Real estate, if you can't buy a property, and this is my philosophy, and I have REITs in my portfolio too, they pay like, you know, anywhere between four and 5%, which is great. But the interest rate conundrum hampers their price, but that also increases the dividend, right? Because this goes back to what you said earlier. 
if the price of a dividend paying stock drops significantly, it's an inverse relationship with the dividend yield. Exactly. So it becomes more attractive, but real Assuming estate they can sustain their operations and, and uh, revenues and stuff. Right. And this is why free cash flow becomes the Holy grail for these, for these companies. Another thing that tech stocks don't necessarily have is a lot of free cash flow. the way that oil producers now and, and, and real estate, energy and all that stuff. Yeah. They, they, they have. So we're shifting from a very speculative tech mania to a very cash free cash flow type of environment too. And I think that's going to make or break companies. Here's an interesting, right an interesting read a play I'm focusing on is, um, old age homes and stuff like that because i want to play the boomer game and there's a massive boomer population as people get older there's going to be a lot of like demand for that side so i that's the play i'm going i'm going more for boomer reits and like old age reits rather than like commercial and stuff like that that's smart actually um when you think about it i I had another thing that's kind of tied to that um it's probably going to get frowned upon for me bringing this up but um, death care is another big area. Um, well, Boomer is a massive ba- population base. So this is just numbers. Like you just look at numbers and then you make your adjustment. But death death care is going to soar uh, in the next. I mean, it already is. But there's a lot of good names out there, um, particularly with like funeral homes and cremations mm. uh, that are paying like you know three to five to maybe seven percent dividends. Um, I don't own it yet, but I, I did get a peek at one that's in Canada. It's called Park Lawn Cor- Corporation, so PLC. Um, they pay about a 4% dividend. It's trading at $34 on the TSX. It's also a small cap. Go figure. Again, not an investment recommendation. Do your own due diligence. Um, if there are regulators listening to this, please don't sue us. Um, I'm just talking about what we're looking at. But um, yeah, I kind of just want to wrap it up here, man. Um, I think the important thing with with yields is just um, it's it's going to get a, it's going to be a very tightening environment right now uh, yeah. with the way this is playing out. By the way, Russian ruble recovered. Yeah. So people were talking about sanctions hurting Russia. I kind of laughed it off. Um, I saw Jim Rickards talk about it too, and I was yeah. just like, dude, like it's going to hurt the Western consumer more than it's going to hurt, you know, the Russians or whoever they're trying to sanction, which is funny. It's because so. they, people, they, you know, so back to this whole politicians, like the world is playing an economic battleground battlefield, like battle right now. Well, it's an economic have, war and you That's have politicians is. who don't know what the hell they're doing, making economic decisions. And they have no idea of the ripple effect because you're clearly seeing it. Oh, first off, they said the Biden administration, we were putting sanctions to deter Russia, blah, 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 blah. What did Biden the other day gets asked about it? And he said, nowhere did we ever say sanctions were meant to deter. Uh, Yeah, you kind of your whole team kind of said that's exactly what you're doing. You're not winning this. Like you have all of Asia is there to kind of like go and work in that environment, in the gaps where USA is trying to kind of get out. India has just expanded relations with Russia. They're buying oil now from Russia at a cheaper price. India's winning. Russia's in, winning. In, in rubles, by the way. So, you know, so uh, <laughs> it's you, you're all you're doing is hurting your, your, your people while you're acting as if you're doing good for some other country. But like, like <laughs> focus on your people first and stop trying to play this global hero game. Like, again, I, I, that's why I keep saying, like, this is an economic planet. If this was not an economic planet and we didn't have to worry about this stuff, then we wouldn't be having this conversation. But the reality is it's all linked. And unfortunately, narratives are getting blown up in people's faces without them actually understanding it. So I, I, I just find it funny. Again, our point, the, the reason why we're bringing this up is to just demonstrate that numbers and narratives are totally disconnected in this world that we're in right now. Um, which is funny, but anyway, I'll save, I'll save my, the rest of my commentary for another time here, Nick. Um, the important thing for everyone here, um, follow us on YouTube, follow us on Instagram. We're at new gen mindset, uh, new gen mindset podcast, uh, com. And, um, what we'll do next time is we got to get some more guests on here, uh, try to talk about trading a little bit more. Uh, and we will be at the Vancouver resource investment conference. So please check us out there. If you're in Vancouver, we'd love to meet you. Uh, But in the meantime, I guess we'll see you next time on the New Gen Mindset Podcast. Ciao, guys.